Welcome everyone to the uh, latest Zoom event from Leeds Theosophical Society. We've been doing these now for almost four years and uh, we pride ourselves on having a great diversity of different people uh, coming to uh, talk to us and everything. Uh, this afternoon we welcome Susan Leyburn, a very long-standing member of the Theosophical Society and a former president of uh, Leeds Theosophical Society in the past. Uh, Susan is currently studying for a PhD and she has interests in numerous different areas of esotericism and I hope that we'll be able to cover some of them this afternoon. So welcome Susan. If I could just ask people to mute themselves if they haven't. So um, let's begin at the beginning Susan. When did you first start becoming interested in things that were, shall we say, beyond the normal, uh, unusual, mysterious things, esotericism and that sort of thing. Is that something that goes back? Uh, it uh, does. It goes back. It goes back right to the beginning where uh, as soon as I could think, I thought about the universe. I thought about God. I thought, why are we here? Um, what did that dream mean? Um, is there another world? Is there another reality? And um, and I started to study when I was about five, you know, because my mum and dad took me to the local library just to pick out something stabilising, you know, come away with Janet and John or Baba the Elephant or something. And I came away with a book on the history of astrology. So um, that was the beginning because I was, even though I was five, uh, it took me a long time to read that book because I was adamant. My mum said, you won't understand it. It's too old for you. And of course, it was too old for me, but I was adamant. And, and each book that I got from the library, I kept thinking there, there will be something in this book that will tell me about my own experiences, about my own beliefs, about my own thoughts and understandings of the world. Um, and of course, there never is, isn't isn't there? You know, you kind of study, and it kind of gives you a little piece, and another piece, and another piece. Um, and uh, uh, that was my kind of introduction to you know, kind of spiritual texts and spiritual uh, um, information, esoteric information, which covered many religions. Um, so you know, I whatever appealed to me i would just you know kind of take take the library book and, and and work through it and did you have experiences as a young child or as you were growing up as later as a teenager which confirmed the sort of things you were trying to ask yourself and presented another world to you in forms of dreams or in other experiences mm. Yes, I, I had a lot of psychic experiences, things that my mum and dad couldn't explain and didn't want to explain because it was just too beyond them, you know. And there were just ordinary working class people um, and everything that, I, you know, and I've come down from, you know, from having woken up and gotten up and said, oh, I had this amazing dream or... Um, I had this vision because I even had visions as a small child <laughs> and, and it was kind of, Oh God, you know, what's the, what's happening next, you know? So, um, you know, it probably, it was quite distressing to them, you know, it's like, what can we do with this, with, with this strange weirdo? What can we do with her? <laughs> um, so, uh, I was quite, um, you know, a kind of isolated child. Uh, I was, um, you know, an only child. So, um, I, I I looked a lot at um, you know kind of reading books as as a way into another reality, a comforting reality, to be honest. So that was my experience. But yes, I had psychic experiences, things that you know, things that I would say that came true, and things like that. And and I started to sort of develop in that way, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know much more about it. How do you control it? Uh, what are the, what are some methods and uh, things like that? And when you reached adulthood, did you um, have experiences? Did you meet people? Did you come across information, organisations, which suddenly attracted you and helped you to move further on down this path? Well, uh, I, I was part of several groups, um, you know, kind of esoteric groups, magical groups. But I also used to go to uh, a thing called a positive living group, 
and and that was very superficial to be truthful you know it was it was only at one level and i and i'd had a really um really interesting mentor who i worked with for 15 years who was a very high adept in neoplatonism and philosophy and mysticism and kabbalah and hermetics and and he and I remember he had certain theosophical books and things like that. Um, but we never really discussed, oh, you know, Madame Blavatsky said this or Alice Bailey said that. I remember he had a big collection of Alice Bailey. And uh, and I thought, well, because he was a very elderly man, I thought when, when Richard is gone, um, what will I do? And I was going to these kind of positive living groups and things and various other discussion groups and not really finding people at the right level to, you know, and that seemed kind of sort of disappointing. And then I met someone who said, you really ought to go to the Theosophical Society. But that was the end of the meeting and they were getting the courts and I had to run for a bus and it was a man and his wife. And they, and um, and I thought, right, I'll ask him next time where it is. And all I knew is is uh, it's near the Merrion Centre. That's all I knew. And so I um, set about trying to find this theosophical building in Leeds and I couldn't find it. And I searched for about six months to find it. Until one day, I was coming out of uh, W.H. Smith's and this man and his wife, they were passing by again. So I grabbed them and, and found out, oh, right, OK, that meeting you were telling me about, where is it? And he told me exactly where it where, where it is and where to go to. Um, of the first time, I found that I was li listening to people talking at a, a similar level to my own mentor, um, the first lecture I listened to, it was a lady who had come from London and she spoke on, is, uh, is spiritual practice harmful? Uh, I've never heard someone mention this in, you know, in a talk at all. It's like, oh, do this, do that. Do... But this lady, you know, she, she gave a really academic talk on the dangers of spiritual unfoldment. And, um, and I thought, this is quite interesting. So and that started to go regularly to the meetings. So um, um, so I've always enjoyed, you know, kind of theosophical discussion and um, not necessarily as a hardline theosophist, but as someone who is interested in different belief systems and comparative religion. Um, so that was my kind of early fumblings into, um, into groups and things. Now, one of the things that's um, interested me about you is um, at some point in your career, you were a chaplain to one of the universities, I believe. Yes, I, I, it was uh, uh, kind of strange, but uh, because I've been working in America and I've been ordained as a uh, as a reverend in a particular church, it was kind of a you know kind of multi faith, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, church that you could be anything or nothing, you know, and um, uh, and you had to write all these essays. I remember having to write twenty essays on different aspects of philosophy and different aspects of ethics and a whole variety of things, even things like the Virgin Birth and what do you think about it. <laughs> so, um, uh, and at the end of that, you know, I got my kind of ordination certificate. And I came back and I remember being at a party in York and there was a very loud mouth American man. And he said, well, you know, you've got this certificate. It's great. It's fantastic. Something to hang on your wall. But what are you going to do with it? And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I had no idea what to do with it. And he said, you know, Leeds University, they have a, lo a lot of pagan students, people interested in you know, metaphysics and magic and philosophy and, you know, and they could quite easily get entangled in in things that are not, you know, quite, you know, kind of okay, you know, things that are, um, you know, inaccurate or things that are um, e even harmful, you know, harmful groups and so on. And, and um, 
you ought to approach the chaplaincy centre to tell them that, you know, you, you'd be available. And I thought, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can. So by the end of the evening, all these people in this party, they were all encouraging me to contact Leeds University Chaplaincy Centre. So I spoke to the senior Anglican chaplain and he said, well, um, I have to put it to three different committees, but it sounds like a really good idea and I think that it would be very, very valuable. So um, he said, leave it to me. And, and sure enough, that each of these different committees, they said, yes, I think it would be a really good and valuable uh, addition to uh, to have somebody who was advisor on on things like occult topics and things and paganism and druidry and, you know, all sorts of everything. And magic as well and, uh, and so forth. So uh, they said, what you need to do now is you need to go to the Occult Society meeting which is a group called Cabal, and then stand up and tell them what you want to do, and we'll, we'll do a they'll do a vote. Uh, well, I knew all of those people because I'd been going to the Cabal Society for a long time, so they all knew me, uh, and they were all blown away. And they said, "Oh yes, 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 yes." <laughs> well, this information, you know, so the Susan Laybourne, Pagan Chaplain, Leeds University, it went right round the world. I was sort of internationally famous and notorious overnight. Um, you know, I was condemned by the Archbishop of York, and, <laughs> and you know, I was, he spoke about me in his in his Christmas Day address. You know, so um, it was. Um, uh, a bit of a whirlwind, and I did this, and um, until until I moved down to Northamptonshire, and um, but you know that was quite a, a quite a journey. What did that work actually involve? Did did it involve um, personal interactions with individual students as well as organisations? It, it did because uh, fraught through that, uh, I had several invitations to speak at universities on theology modules and and um the odd thing in women's studies but mostly theology and um um but i also saw students as well who some were interested in different particular paths you know kind of i want to get into this particular path but i don't know anything about it now, because I had a huge back catalogue of spiritual knowledge and um, for do say so myself, you know, very, uh, um, you know, knowing about the magical systems of these things, I was able to sort of help people and guide them. Um, and I even had people from Thailand and from Malaysia and places like that. Uh, um, we we ended up doing kind of swaps as well, you know, kind of you teach me about Western magic and I'll teach you about, you know, kind of what we do in Malaysia, you know. <laughs> and so, and I, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So um, we had quite a lot of interaction. I had, you know, quite a lot of interactions with students and um and people who were doing modules, or they had to find out about, because you've got to think that this is the days before, you know, everyone had the internet. And, you know, if you wanted to find out about, you know, kind of, you know, medieval grimoires, or you needed to find out about witchcraft trials in, you know, in Germany in the 1600s or something, you know, you had to search through lots of books to find this information. And sometimes it's, it's sometimes better to speak to someone such as myself and um, who could sit you down with a tea or coffee and, and then say, right, OK, so what are you doing? What What's your approach? What do you need to look at? Uh, and so that was a, a way forward, but also the sort of pastoral uh, side as well. Um, you know, I had, you know, one girl that her twin sister had suddenly died Um and she didn't really have a, a, a kind of a compass of what do I do? And she was on the point of of leaving her course and just not continuing because it was just too 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 stressful for her. Uh, so pastoral stuff, giving people advice. Uh, I had one one lad who um, 
uh, he, he became homeless and stayed on my settee for about <laughs> for about two weeks. Um, so um, even though that's not part of the role, you know, we'd become friends. So I thought, you know, come and stay at mine. And uh, so a variety of things uh, along those. Um, so, yeah. So based on that and based on your interactions and your, your knowledge of the young people at that university at that time, where do you think young people are coming from today in terms of their spiritual interests? Are these as intense, perhaps, as they were in the past? Have they changed? What I think I'm really trying to get at here is that we spend a lot of time here in the Theosophical Society beating our breasts and saying, why can't we attract more young people to what we do or to our talks and everything? What would your advice be? I mean, there there are uh, academic studies, certainly now, you know, in um, Amsterdam, in Gothenburg, in parts of America, you know, you, uh, and they've opened a new um, a new course, an MA course in Exeter, which is basically about magic and things like that. Um, but you know, there's uh, Western esotericism, um, uh, with the Hanagraphs, uh, uh, you know you know, major baby. He, he's uh, uh, he's done some fantastic work in Amsterdam. Um, you know, so it, the people's minds are kind of opening a lot more towards esoteric study. And um, not just for practitioners, but for the kind of theory, the textual analysis and things like that. So it's becoming a little bit more on the surface that people can actually go to a university and study metaphysics, study occultism, study the history of it, not necessarily the practice of it, but the history of it, uh, and, uh, um, and to compare these things with anthropological uh, material, to compare it with, um, uh, uh, for example, in my field, uh, where I'm looking at uh, Neoplatonic theurgy, Scholarship now is now moving very closely towards, well, let's look at what uh, 9th, 10th century tantrics were doing. You know, let's see if we can, you know, use tantra as a lens by which we can explore theurgy and get a, get a better handle on what they were doing or what they were trying to do. Um, and, you know, and in my early research, you know, my uh, perspective was, well, there was a lot of information in Jewish mysticism in the Hechelot material and Merkaba material and um, apocalyptic uh, stuff. So we can see that there's some crossovers. Um, so I think that people now, they are searching for information, but unfortunately, they go to TikTok, they go to social media, they go to, you know, YouTube and things like that. And I mean, you can find out a lot of interesting things on YouTube, but, you know, to have some, um, you know, 17-year-old person, you know, all in black, you know, with lots of silver. And I'm, like, I'm a witch, you know, and I'm the expert on this. And it's it's a bit, um, it's a bit kind of just add water, stick it in the microwave and, you know, you will, you know, kind of achieve a huge amount of, you know, knowledge, power, and it's nonsense. So all of this that legwork is, is gone. It, it's clear there is uh, and has been um, a real upsurge of uh, interest in this in academic circles, as you say, in Paris and Amsterdam, currently in Copenhagen, America and elsewhere. What about those people who are not of an academic persuasion and who are not really comfortable with just doing conventional academic studies? What's the way of reaching them? Is it through TikTok and Instagram and all these other platforms which people of my age don't particularly understand? Or is there another way, do you think? I, I think when you try to reach out to people, I think certainly um, having human contact is a very important thing. Um, a Facebook friend who I don't actually know, but I just know him from Facebook, uh, uh, I met up with him last Saturday 
um, by the end of the afternoon, he said, oh, you know, um, uh, maybe we should, you know, well, we both decided, maybe we should put like a bit of a call out, you know, to form an esoteric sort of discussion group, get people coming together to discuss different aspects of esotericism and mystical practice and things like that. And it would be like, you know, coffee and cake and have it at a local cafe. So, you know, we put out feelers and, you know, very little uptake. You know, some people that were into it, but they were too far away. And again said, let's do it on Zoom. Um, I think it's there's importance in human contact because while, while it's kind of down, down here, you know, kind of away from... Uh, you're, you know, you, I like to sniff people, you know, to feel the energy, you know, of individuals. And, and you know, I think that sometimes when, you know, if you're listening to a Zoom session, and I've done it myself, that, you know, it might start off, there are 30 people on the, you know, uh, participants. And, you know, unless you get their attention early on, you see it dwindling away and dwindling away and they think, oh, there's a good film on. All oh, right, I want to go make a cup of tea. You know, if you're in a meeting, you can't disappear. You know, you've just got to stick it out and listen. The good bit might be coming later. So I think that um, the internet, it's, it's, uh, it's a useful ally, but it's also... Um, you know, it, it can be the enemy of real development because having to go and, you know, find that mentor, sit in that guy's front room, be nervous, you know, <laughs> so what? You're nervous. Go and do it. Mm. It does seem sometimes that there is this disconnect. The, the Theosophical Society has often been criticised down the years um, is not doing very much. It's all about lectures. It's very much on the mental plane. Do you think theosophy should have something else? I mean, should it do things? Should it have more of a, a ritual or ceremonial aspect the way that other groups do? Or I, mean, I think if you literally. if you read uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky's writings, there's a lot of a lot of information there about you know, kind of working with elementals and work, working with um, subtle energies about psychic powers and things like that. And in the early days, uh, I, I, um, I, I'm kind of, it's not really in the open, but I do think that there were, there must have been some kind of um, ritual element, some kind of meditative element. And there certainly is in the esoteric uh, sort of section where, you know, there's sort of an emphasis on, you know, kind of mind yoga, raja yoga and so on, um, that, you know, these practices are kind of encouraged. But I think that there is still um, a need for something more regular. You know, if you go to a, a lodge meeting, you know, I remember that there used to be a meditation, a statement of the you know the obstacle. You know the articles of the uh, of society, and a short meditation to bring people into a harmonious vibration. Because this is an important thing that when people are meditating together, they are in a harmonious vibratory state that their energies link up, so that you don't get arguments and disagreements and discord and so forth you get more of uh you know we're all together trying to better understand better to take this information apart to to learn more so i think even meditation westerners are really funny about meditation that how do i go about it um my own practice is a kind of an emptiness practice going into a void-like state. I'm not looking for, you know, I'm not going down a leafy lane to meet a guide. Um, I, I'm just hoping to experience me at my divine self state, you know, that kind of thing, and just kind of dwell. You know, Patanjali, he he, he said this, is that, this, you know, certain practices where you, you know, you are residing in your own essence. Um, and modern mediums have ad adopted practices like this because, you know, they're being, you know, kind of reintroduced into 
you know, for example, into spiritualism where they say, oh, sitting in the power. We'll do sitting in the power. And you're not looking for any information. An interesting thing, I mean, Leadbeater, he, he had said in his um, 1911 work, uh, um, uh, you know, on the inner life, his second volume, and he talks about, you know, this, this sort of need for um, recognising where you are in your own state. And he refers to this idea of, you know, just because the winds, you know, for example, psychic winds blow the curtain up to one side when I'm sitting in my living room, doesn't mean and I might see somebody walking by. They're not walking by for me, you know. And I think a lot of people in meditation, they may see a guide, they may see a colour, they may see a dog, they may get, you know, who knows, they might see a tree, and they think, oh, this is some kind of indication of my growth or what, you know, what the kind of powers beyond that are trying to get that kind of guide me towards. And it may not be the case. It hardly ever is the case. Um, I, it's just that you've got to a certain stage in your your meditation, and it's usually in the kind of theta level that you start, you know, your brain starts throwing up all sorts of nonsense. Can I put something else to you? I mean, one of the things that I've felt very much about the Theosophical Society and um, since I was a member was that the third object... Um, exploring um, hidden forces and the powers latent in human beings or whatever. This has always seemed to me to be one of those objectives that we neglect and that it provides, these days especially, a real good opportunity to work with more enlightened scientists and people from other professions and everything. And I don't think we do that in the way that perhaps the early days of the Theosophical Society were able to achieve that. I mean, forging greater links with people, certainly in scientific communities, I think would be an excellent thing. What, what would you feel about that? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, if you look at some of the early works, um, you know, for example, you know, kind of, um, you know, esoteric chemistry and things like that, the nature of man and um, looking at, also, these various planes of existence. Now, one of my areas of interest has been neuroscience, what the brain is doing during altered states of consciousness, during trance states, during visions, during clairaudience, what part of the brain is working. Uh, so I got very, very interested and very excited by your kind of neuroscience and um, what does it all mean? Um especially to one's spiritual development and what the you know what the brain is doing because I mean I was listening to something last night, you know, and it was some philosophical piece to do with Hegel, you know, and and even in you know 1805, you know, Hegel had said things like, you know, the mind is not in the head. It's in some kind of field of consciousness between people. And then I started to think, well, hang on a minute. What if it's just you on your own? You know, does mind dissolve? You know, well, again, the discussion didn't go that way. But this idea of um, you know, morphogenetic fields and so forth, you know, it's been discussed by philosophers uh, in, uh, you know, in recent times, but, you know, in the last couple of hundred years. But it, it's something of an important factor that we do it take on board things like um, fields of consciousness and states of awareness and even things like, um, you know, like, the, you know, kind of these various masters and so forth. But people get very excited about masters and guides and angelic beings and, and so forth. But where are they in relation to us? You know, are they a breath away? Are they on a higher, you know, kind of uh, vibratory state, like tuning along the radio band? Where are they? You know, uh, are, are they close to us uh, in in pers personality, uh, in in structure, and so forth? So I, I kind of get interested in that kind of thing. 
um, you know, and certainly in spiritualism, you know, this idea has gone from like one named guide to uh, a spirit team who may be nameless. And of course, you can have, you know, maybe five, 10, 15 guides who work with you for a variety of different purposes. So, um, and I do believe that we do need to look at, uh, you know, kind of higher contacts, higher plane contacts, because all magical groups going back, you know, to, you know, the Golden Dawn, the OTO, uh, the Society of the Inner Light, um, all of these these various groups, um, they, they always refer to themselves as being fully contacted groups, fully contacted lodges, fully contact. And that suggests that it means that they have got guidance from a higher source, whereas a lot of groups now they might have a book and they'll go by, you know, a set text and things like this, and they'll fumble around in, um, you know, there may be a kind of a modicum of leadership, but they'll fumble around from, from one topic to the next, but they're not connected to the source of that power. Um, you know, and certainly um, being in an initiatory tradition, of a particular order or a particular group is very different from just finding that finding the book of rituals in the local waterstones or somewhere, taking it home and thinking, right, page one, I start with this, page two, I start with that, and I'm going to do this ritual. Um, it, you will not get the same results unless you are part of that initiatory cycle, like, because there are certain things that you will not know and that are not in the books. Um, so I think that that there's a, a a great need for instruction. There's a great need for understanding what things are um, referring to. Um, I mean, for example, I, I recently took a course, which was an online course on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And one of the first pieces that we looked at, it referred to the seer. And I and of course me interested in you know kind of altered states of consciousness, psychic awareness, etc. I had read the seer in reference to the person who is the mystic seer, but no, um, the the tutor um, explained that the seer is the witness, and the witness is the soul. So this is what it's talking about. It's not talking about some mystic power within ourselves. It's talking about the soul as the witness. Um, so that was quite interesting um, in just, the development we, of the soul. Yes. Can, we, can we just move on, on to the cat? One thing that also concerns me is, I mean, a lot of people who come into these things, A, it's, I mean, we live in very much a me, me, me world at the moment, don't we? And people come into these things for personal advantage often. I mean, it might be spiritual growth, but they might want um, other things too. Um, and is it your view that perhaps people's motivation sometimes is a little bit questionable and, and different perhaps from what it was in the past? You know, does, is this something? Yeah, that I, I think so. I think that there's a lot of people who are interested, interested from a kind of power over uh, perspective. I want to control my life. I want to become wealthy or successful. Um Certainly this, this new movement, which is to do with manifestation and the law of attraction, it, it's all material world based. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I want to be wealthy. I want I want to have a beautiful car and a beautiful wife and a beautiful villa in the south of France and all of these things. And it's kind of intention setting and, it, and it, it's not helping others. Um, you know, it's all ego based. And if it's all ego-based, your evolution is only going to be to a certain degree or a certain level. And this is the problem because most people, they they want to be able to show their friends, you know, look at my diamond bracelet, look at my, you know, uh, my beautiful life, my, you know, look at my new, uh, you know, air fryer or whatever it might be. Uh, so there's a lot of things of, of, you know, kind of show and tell. Well, this is a spiritual paralysis, isn't it? When people it get is, and and 
really, you know, with true evolution of the spirit and evolution of the soul and evolution of the mind, that there isn't really much of a show and tell, you know, that there isn't anything to, you know, to kind of hold up and say, look, I'm a, I'm a master of. Well, anyone who says I'm a master of is, is, is a charlatan. You know, they're not a master of anything, but they want to be perceived as one and they're going to ask for money at the end of it. So, um, you know, the true the true person is the person who sees something in another, takes them under their wing and, and guides them to be um, as good as and then better than them, them themselves. And that yeah. was... That was the original idea of mentorship, you know, not these paid things where people spend nearly two thousand pounds for a few a few weekends, you know, on a few Zoom courses and things. Which that seems to be, you know, what mentorship has become now. Um, yeah, and what but, it also means, Susan. Sorry to interrupt, but what it yeah. also means is that people think that they can get almost instantaneous results. You go on a weekend seminar you get a certificate at the end of it you pay whatever you pay and then mm. that's it you know you it's almost like taking something out of a tin or a packet and suddenly you know enlightenment it doesn't yeah. work like people are not i don't think people really um are prepared to put in the effort in the way perhaps people did in the past maybe i'm wrong about that maybe it's just because i'm a, a grumpy old man that i'm saying these things but i suspect that people expect something for nothing here a lot of the time I worked in America in um, the early 2000s, and, I, and there I was in Beverly Hills, and the guy who was hosting me, he said, you know, we ought to set up a group. We ought to, all, you know, have some sort of, um, you know, organisation. And I was all for this. I thought this would be nice, you know, it'd be it'll be good. And my perspective is to teach people how to be their own god. You know, to be, you know, to teach people how to be, not necessarily reliant on what I say or what anyone else says, but to find the the power within themselves to supply their own answers. It may be based on things that they've read or things that they've encountered, but things that they've evolved within their own spirit and their own soul. Uh, and you know, this man, he, he, you know, he, he said. You can't teach people that, you know, they want to be told, they want to be spoon fed. And I said, well, why do they want to be spoon fed? And so they won't believe it's real otherwise. Um, you know, so I found myself sort of backing out of that. I thought, I don't really want to be a cult leader, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of explaining, you know, stuff to people and, you know, kind of, you know, fining them, you know, if they, if they fail to get the lesson and things like this, you know, so, um, you know, I think that people do want instant, you know, kind of just stick it in the microwave or, you know, work to the end of that lesson. And whether they've kind of grasped the material of the lesson, I'm not for lesson one, lesson two, you know. I mean, I went to my mentor um, and uh, every, all the teachings occurred you know, kind of, you know, with tea and, tea and cake in his front room. And, you know, and I'd be there all day. I went every two weeks and I'd be there all day and became part of the family and um, would sometimes go and do some sort of practical work. But generally speaking, all of the philosophical teachings, all of the metaphysical teachings, the occult teachings, they were all based on just sitting and talking. And he said to me, he said, you know, people are sometimes, they find their way to me. And, you know, they get their notepad out because they're expecting lesson one and lesson two and we're going to do this. And, and, and that's not the way it works. That I have to feel the energy of the crowd, you know, feel the energy of the person and decide, you know, kind of feel what, what to give them. Um, it doesn't matter what you want. It's what what your soul needs. Okay, good. Um, just to um, wind things up, you are currently studying for a A P, I believe. Um, can you tell us briefly a little bit about what the thrust of that is, and uh, 
what you've discovered on this particular journey as you've been researching this? I've discovered a lot of really exciting things. My research is, uh, my title is on the origins, development and theurgy of the Chaldean oracles. And the Chaldean oracles are a very fragmentary text that it doesn't exist like the Nag Hammadi uh, fragments or any of those things or the, you know, things from Qumran. Uh, there are no actual fragments. You can't go to a museum and see them pinned up somewhere. They've only survived in the writings of Neoplatonists, um, pagan Neoplatonists, and also some Christian Neoplatonists. Um, so uh, the material that we're working with, it's very much based on uh, Platonic study, um, Middle Platonic study, um, Neopythagoreanism, an element of Stoic ideas, and um, it, uh, and a practice that uh, that we now understand as theurgy, which means God work, and. Uh, it's basically about allowing the gods to work on us so that we can ascend to a higher realm, a higher level. So, um, you know, these practices, they're in the text that I'm working from. I've identified uh, three, possibly four different types of theurgy that's been described. Um but we we kind of stuck with this kind of pseudo mythology of where the text comes from, when it evolved, um, when it developed, and 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 so so on and so forth. And this is kind of replicated still by uh, modern scholars who are working basically with the ideas that developed uh, from 1928 onwards. Um, so you know this is one of the issues that modern scholars they just copy the 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 ideas of their peers and their forebears uh without looking at the text and without questioning the text and without questioning the history so i, I i've looked very deeply into the history i've looked very deeply into the locations because there are no locations mentioned but it's basically about the philosophical practices um and we see um, one important figure is uh, Iamblichus, who was a very important um, theurgist, and he wrote an important work called On the Mysteries. He's called that now, but originally it got a very long-winded title. Uh, you know, it's, and he, you know, so and so's response to <laughs> it's basically an. It's, uh, responding to someone else's um, inquiries, please explain this to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's a lot of ideas that are regarded as theurgic, uh, but we also see from the kind of um, Italian Renaissance that there is this sense of let's look at these things again. Um, as certainly uh, before that, with the writings of Michael Psellus, so as a Byzantine scholar, uh, he looked at these oracles again, and he looked at the work of Proclus, so a forgotten text or a lost text, it's lost to us, um, and it, it appears as if he's kind of arguing, please don't get involved in this, it's grubby, you know, don't get involved in it. Um, so... You know, I'm looking at a lot of things that have been accepted previously and now may not have been accepted, it may not be that acceptable. But I'm looking at all sorts of com comparative practices that are to do with solar sense. Um, okay. Thank you very much indeed, Susan. We'll, we'll wind this up there because I'm sure, as always, uh, there are going to be some uh, questions and comments. So thank you, Susan, for... Uh, very wide ranging uh, discussion. Just to wish you um, a very good week. Thanks again, Susan. Thanks to you all. And we'll see you again in the future. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.